welcome back to my channel my channel hey sweetie squad what's up my lovies happy sunday all right guys as you can see i don't have my cat ears on right now so you know that it's going to be a serious video this video is going to be one of my crime stories and this i hold this story very near and dear to my heart i've been following it since day one and it's such a it's a story that could have been so easily prevented so we are about to talk about the life and unfortunate death of Mia McConnell. Let's get started. Mia McConnell, born on April 26, 2002. To Yiman, I can't say her name that good, I'm sorry. Her mother, oh my God, absolutely beautiful. She looked just like her, um, Mia looked just like her mother and Marlon McConnell. Let me tell you something. This girl right here, this woman, okay, she was 19 years old. She was starting her life she was, she just graduated from high school. She was going to college for sports medicine. Most beautiful. I could, I could literally sit here and talk about this girl's beauty all day. She's probably one of the most gorgeous girls I've ever seen in my life. She had these gray green eyes. She had a very petite, very uh, perfect body. I mean, just gorgeous. Okay. And unfortunately for her, sometimes our beauty is what is the cause of a lot of unfortunate things that has to happen to us. And it, it really does suck because men should know, no means no. So Mia Marcano, her story starts out on September 24th. She was getting off of work. She worked at Arden, Villa, Arden Villa's apartment. She also lived there as well. She was getting off work at four, I'm sorry, at five o'clock. And she was about to head to the airport to go to Fort Lauderdale to visit her family. Now she's from South Florida, but she was living in Orlando to go to school. So she, I went home and according to the key fob, and this is very crucial for you, let's keep listening to the key fob. Her key fob entered at 5.06, she entered her apartment. And that is the last whereabouts known about of Mia Marcano. So how does the story end? The story ends in a very tragic way. So Mia, like I said, she was about to board this plane. She was about to go see her family. Her family got very worried when they did not hear from her. She was very connected to her family. They are, I believe, Trinidadian from the Virgin Islands. Just a very, very close-knit family. Very family-oriented. And, I mean, she was their baby. She was their princess. And the dad last got a text message from her when she said, I love you. And he, he said, I love you. And she said, I love you too. That was the last text message that went out. And I believe that went out at 503, if I'm not mistaken. And that is the last text, last any, any time her family had heard from her. So the family got very worried. They, they thought maybe she was on the plane. So that's because her plane was at seven o'clock when nine o'clock came and they saw that she did not get off on that plane, nor did she ever board the plane. The mother got very worried. The mother decided to call down to the apartment complex, the, the Arden Villas, call the emergency line, no answer, no answer. And then she decided, well, let's do a welfare check, you know, check on her in the apartment. The police, I believe, went there. I'm not exactly sure the time of that, but the police went there and her bedroom door was locked. Her bedroom door was locked and the roommate had actually came home. And this is how everything gets so just weird as heck, how this investigation, I'll just go ahead and tell you this, the police failed Mia and her apartment complex failed Mia tremendously. So this, this deputy, the uh, allows the roommate to actually enter through Mia's window and Mia's window was actually opened you can like it was like you could tell the screws were taken out and now her father had made sure that before she moved into that apartment that he put special screws because she didn't want the window to open at all whatsoever like I said this girl was very well protected she was the baby of the family so the police officer lets the, the, the roommate go through the window to open up her bedroom door. First of all, I mean, this girl is potentially right now just missing, but why would you do that? Why would you let your, an innocent bystander pretty much go into an apartment of a missing woman? I mean, the predator could have still been there. Something could have, I mean, anything messing with evidence, anything. By the way, they did not dust for fingerprints either. And like I said, this story is just ridiculous of how the police handled it. So according to the roommate, 
the there was a dresser against Mia's bedroom door preventing basically from coming inside and going out so that definitely seemed odd there was there was blood found upon her pillow there was her favorite teddy bear that she never leaves home without in her closet there was her favorite necklace broken on the ground and there was a box cutter kind of sticking out from underneath a rug but According to the police investigation, the room was clean and nothing was out of place. Did y'all heard what I just said, right? So again, to the police department right there. So now it's probably like, I want to say it's about 11 o'clock, I want to say. And she has now been officially put into the database for a missing person. Now, According to a bystander, a person heard the deputy say, this is not a high priority, this is not a high priority case. Excuse me, this is somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, somebody's niece, somebody's godmother. It's not a high priority case. I'm very confused by that. So, like I said, the sheriff's office definitely failed Mia and this family. What I'm about to tell you next is going to be completely crazy to you, but it's what happened. So the family arrives finally. I mean, they hightailed it. When they could not get a hold of Mia, they went straight from Fort Lauderdale and drove straight to Orlando. Pajamas, Crocs, whatever. They went and how they were and they were looking for their baby girl. So they get to the apartment complex. It's now 3.30, almost 4 o'clock in the morning. And the maintenance man is outside standing there talking to the deputies when they pull up. Why is a maintenance man there at four o'clock in the morning anyways? And now you can go watch this on YouTube. This, I believe it was the auntie. The auntie was recording and the dad was right next to her. The, um, was of course, you know, his sister was recording as they speak to this maintenance man, maintenance man called Armando Cabrero speaking to him. Okay. And this guy's like, I'm looking for Mia. Like who said Mia was missing? Mm, did who's who knew so he's on the phone with some girl and i b believe she was a co-worker of mia's but they're saying that oh supposedly he's she told him that, that mia was missing but at this case like i said nobody knew where mia was and this guy is just talking to the deputies well they remember hearing about a maintenance man harassing mia and the aunt basically tells him like listen we know you're obsessed with her we know that you sent her unwanted text messages, phone calls, cash apps, just all this stuff. And he's basically, it, it look, he looked so guilty when he's like, would I be here right now if I was guilty? Like he put his arms up like to be arrested. Like it was just really eerie. It was just very eerie and awkward. And so the father's saying like, you know, you, what are you doing here? Like you just woke up out your sleep and decided to come look for Mia? So like I said, it's it's very sketchy. And I honestly don't, I don't believe that the police would have ever caught on to that if it wasn't for this family doing their own investigating. And that's what's so sad about it is that the family had to do the police's job. So they let him go. After hearing what the family has to say, after hearing that he's obsessed with their, with, with this missing woman, he's here looking for her, it, they let him go. So the next day, they're out putting flyers up and all of a sudden they see Armando pull into a complex. They say, let's follow him. Because at this point, this is their only suspect in their mind. They just, Mia has not, her phone is turned off. She always talks to her grandmother. She always talks to her father. She always talks to her mother, her brother, and nobody has heard from Mia. It's not like her at all. Not to mention, like I said, her room, her room looked like a crime scene. So they decide to follow him and he gets out of his car with a blue glove on and a purple and white blanket. The grandmother immediately freaks out and is like, oh my God, that is my blanket. That is my blanket. They tell the cops. The cops come to Armando's complex. Obviously, he's already stashed it to this day. I have not heard if they found that blanket in a black bag he was holding. I've not heard nothing about that to this day. And it's been two months. Because this story started, like I said, on September 24th. Well, almost two months. And so they're, they're um, you know, recording him and everything. They go tell the cops. The cops come. And they don't let the, the Armando 
the deputy don't go into Armando's apartment to look for Mia or Mia's things. They let the family go. The Like I said, the family had to do all their own investigating. So the family's looking in Armando's apartment, looking for Mia, looking for the belongings. Of course, nothing's to be found because he had already stashed it by then. They let Armando go again. And at this time, he has scratches on his face and bruises on his hands. And they still let him go. That's Saturday. Sunday, nobody hears from Armando. Monday morning, Monday morning, they get a phone call at 9.45, 10 o'clock in another apartment complex that there is a man found hanging in a paint garage dead. It's Armando Cabrero. 27-year-old Armando has now taken his life. Mia is still missing. Nobody has heard of her. And if Arden Villas, and I'm putting complete blame on them, Arden Villas would have answered the mother's emergency call or came out to the complex to look to see who last entered Mia's apartment, they would have seen that it was Armando. And he did not he did not enter that apartment only once that day. He entered her apartment multiple times. So we're about to go back to the timeline in just a second. At this point, they went and finally went to get a search warrant for Armando. And I believe it was like at five o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, Monday morning. It was too late. He was already dead. He killed he had killed himself uh probably that night or whatever because they said he was deceased. He was already starting rigor mortis and yeah, well, I'm not going to get into that. So he has killed, he has taken his life and the family is now coming from Canada, New York, uh, I believe Jamaica. They came all over to search for their baby girl. The police tell the family, if you don't hear from Mia by Tuesday, come back. You think really the family was going to sit by and allow that to wait? No, they immediately started their own, basically their own search party. They're looking for Mia everywhere. They finally get the phone records of Armando Cabrero and they notice that he went here, there, everywhere on Friday night. Why did Armando do that? Because he knew that they were, it was going to try to throw people off the track, off their tracks. <sighs> Vigils for Mia outside of her apartment are, are happening every night. The family is praying so hard. The father has not eaten since Friday. He's looking for his baby girl so hard. The grandmother's praying with all her hearts. The mother is distraught. The aunties is, I mean, it, it's, it's, I prayed and prayed that the baby girl was going to be found alive. <sighs> Eight days later from Mia going missing on September 24th, a body was found in the back of this desolated, it, 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 these apartments were vacant. There, nobody was living there anymore. I forget, I can't think of the word, right? abandoned or whatever. And um, this beautiful baby girl is just, found in the back of the apartment complex in like this grassy area disposed of like of trash. <sighs> Mia was found with tape on her mouth and her hands and feet bound together. A couple of feet from her was her purse and inside that purse was this red shirt that she was wearing the day that she went missing. Mia was found in a robe, a bra, and pants. Jeans, jeans that she was wearing. To this day, there's still not been a cause of death for Mia or a time of death. We don't know if Mia left the apartment complex alive or dead. We don't know how he killed her. We don't know if it was accident. We don't know if it was purpose. We don't know anything. It, it, like I said, this case is so... I, I can't believe it's not got as much coverage as it deserves. And that's why another reason why I'm so into this case, because it's like every day I just pray for justice for this family. Now, they finally had to obviously have a funeral. And this was the most beautiful funeral I have ever seen. They had it on live on the, they had it, um, like a podcast or I can't stream. It was streamed. And oh my God, beautiful casket with her picture on the front of it. And just people made songs for her. And it was over 2,000 people in this um, big, I, I want to say it was a church. 
big, it was like a humongous, it looked like an auditorium. It was so big and just celebrating the life of this beautiful girl taken so soon. Then to the cemetery, the recession, as they call it, you know, she was r ridden through the streets in this ho white horse carriage. It was just, it was a beautiful send off for a true princess. And it, it just breaks my heart for the family because this was their baby. They prayed so hard that she would be found alive and they got their baby back, but not the way they wanted. So here's another thing. Armando's car was taken literally a day after he killed himself. And I've not heard of blood, fingerprints, anything. I've not heard anything. It's crazy. It's like this case is at a standstill. At first, the sheriff, and I, I'm sorry, Sheriff Mina is, is very, the way he just, he talked about how, oh, it wouldn't have helped of the circumstances because Mia was already dead. You don't know that. You don't know that at all. So we're about to go through the timeline real quick so you can basically sum it all up and understand from start to finish. <sighs> so on September 24th at 2.14, the deadbolt to Mia's apartment opened on by an on-call on maintenance uh, key fob known to be in Caballero's possession. At 4.34, a deadbolt to Mia's apartment opened again by Armando Caballero. Why did he go in there twice? And Mia's at work when this is happening. Mia got to work at one o'clock. Why are you going in this woman's apartment? At four at 5.06, Mia uses her key fob to enter her apartment. If only baby girl could have known what was to lie behind that door. That when a woman goes into her house and closes that door, that is our sanctuary. That is our safe place. This creature, this inhumane man was waiting in wait like a predator for her. We don't know what happened in that apartment, but we know that baby girl put up a fight. Definitely. The, it looked like a fight, a struggle had occurred. At 5.52, Caballero's vehicle leaves Arden Villas. 5.06, Mia walks in. 5.52, Armando's uh, car is seen driving out the gate. By the way, the gate, there was, it was open a lot. You didn't really need anything to get into. The gate was open back and forth. Like the people had stressed that they were worried about security issues. And the, like I said, the gate just stayed open sometimes where anybody could go in. At 7.01, Caballero places a fake maintenance call. Why did he do this? to get him back into the apartment complex. We don't know if it's to retrieve Mia. We don't know if it was to retrieve something he left. We don't know. Like I said, this investigation is at a standstill. At 7-11, Caballero contacts the apartment complex and asks the staff to be let into the gate to establish an alibi. At 7-16, someone uses Mia's key fob to swipe the exterior lock to her apartment, but never went in. At 7-38, Caballero's car leaves the apartment complex. Now I'm I'm putting pictures all throughout everything that I've talked about. Um, Mia's apartment was kind of towards like a dead end. It was kind of in a little desolate kind of corner. It sucks because her window it wasn't that it wasn't too far from the ground. She lived on the second on the first floor, and to the right of her literally was an empty vacant lot, and then there was a parking lot right in front. And I believe that they did say that there was tire tracks that went to her window. So we don't, I mean, we don't know for sure. But I believe what I feel, Armando backed the car up. Obviously, he was the maintenance man. He knew how to avoid the cameras. A lot of cameras were not there that should have been there. But he knew how to avoid the cameras. He knew his surroundings. He knew everything. So again, how was this baby girl taken out of this apartment with, without anyone hearing her or seeing her? Again, is the question, did she leave dead or alive? At 7, at, I'm sorry, at 8.20 to 
Caballero's phone is near the timber scan apartments where Mia's body was left. He was only there for 20 minutes. The, ugh. <sighs> 9.23, Mia's mother calls to report that they couldn't reach Mia. She calls the Orlando Sheriff's Department. At 9.42, a deputy is dispatched to the Arden Villas and arrives at 10.02 to check on the well-being as Mia's mother requested. At 1.36, the next day, obviously the morning, September 25th, Mia is entered in the missing persons. At 4.54, deputy meets with Mia's family at Arden Villas. That's also when Armando was out there. At 8.47, Castleberry PD responds to Caballero's apartment after a call from Mia's family reporting that they are seen with a glove, backpack, and a pink blanket. At 9.52, Castleberry stands by while Mia's family looks through Caballero's apartment with his permission. At 3 p.m., Caballero leaves his apartment, and this is the last time he is seen, on, is seen and known anywhere, and that was on Saturday. At 4.30, detectives consider Caballero a suspect in Mia's disappearance. At 5.44, Orlando Sheriff's de uh, detectives secure Car uh, Caballero's apartment as they write a search warrant to submit to a judge. He's already gone. At 9.35, Armando sends one last text message out. To this day, I have no idea what it is. Maybe it's I'm sorry. Maybe it's I to this day, they've not talked about it. They've It's very quiet with this case. At... 1.30 in the morning on September 26, detectives execute a search warrant to Caballero's apartment. At 10.35 on September 27th, Monday morning, Caballero's located deceased by suicide in Seminole County. Now, mind you, this was an apartment that he used to work at, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. At 10.45 on October 2nd, Mia's body was located by the Timberscan Apartments. So that is the timeline. Now, Armando had priors. He had a past record he had i believe it was from 2016 he had an assault on his record okay why didn't arden villas do a thorough background check do you really want someone that had an assault on their record watching your tenants being responsible for entering your tenants apartments so mm. secondly back in march Armando worked at another complex, the complex that he was found dead in. And he apparently asked the woman out. The woman said yes at first, and then she changed her mind. And around 3 o'clock in the morning, a weight was thrown through her window. She swears that she remembers seeing Armando running away. There was no proof, but still. Another woman reported that Armando, she came out the, she came out the shower, and Armando was standing in her living room. This man was a predator. This man could have been stopped. This man did not deserve to work in an apartment complex. Mia had told the apartment complex that she felt uncomfortable around Armando. They did nothing. Mia did not fear for her life from Armando, according to her mother, but because she didn't, she didn't, she didn't think it was that serious. But apparently Armando had this obsession. Mia started working there in July. Armando started working there in, I believe, May. And baby girl was taken on September 24th. The obsession grew very quickly. Again, Mia was so beautiful. Absolutely mind-blowing. But no means no. No means no. He asked her out multiple times and she just did not want it. She was not interested in him. <sighs> A reason I am so annoyed with Arden Villas is uh, not just because of the background check, not because Mia complained, because they did not come out until Monday. They could have been able to apprehend Armando and find baby girl faster than eight days if they would have came out to the apartment complex and looked to see who had the last entry to Mia's apartment. They waited till Monday. Armando was found dead on Monday. So are they at fault? Oh, you damn right they are. They are. They did not obviously look at this as important. Like I said, this was not just their tenant. This was their employee. To this day, they have not gave condolences to the family. They have not sent a card. Nothing. It's like they don't care. And that's why the family is filing a lawsuit. Lawsuit against that apartment complex. And I truly hope they win. 
Not only that, but also there is a Mia Marcano foundation. It's going to be called Mia's Law. Her dad actually was there at the in Tallahassee on Friday trying to get the law signed. And I believe that they're going to pass it for Florida. It's going to allow, instead of this 12-hour notice for maintenance men to enter your apartment, it's a 24-hour notice. It's also going to allow for there to be key logs immediately up, um, available to see who last enters apartments. It's going to make it safer for especially women, men too, but especially for women when we enter our homes. I, even though Mia is gone, her death is not in vain. It's not. Mia's legacy is continuing. Her legacy has already, the Mia's, found, the Mia's foundation, Mia's family helped bring a missing girl back home to her family already. This family is one of the strongest families I've ever heard of in my life. They are just, they, I don't, they're, they're, the, they're the strongest family I've ever seen. Like how they're able to just, yes, baby girl is gone, but they are continuing her legacy every day. There's just something new. And like I said, I truly hope that they find out what, you know, how their, how their daughter passed and, you know, maybe more things to help bring closure. But as the mother said, you would think that it gets easier. It's actually getting harder. It's getting harder of the not knowing. The father sits there and closes his eyes and thinks of what happened, what could have happened, what did happen. You know, it's, that's what's haunting the family is that they just don't have their answers. So Again, I've been wanting to do this video for so long, but I had to make sure I had all my facts, everything in place. And this is it. I want to know in the comment section below, have you heard of this story? Do you, do you even know of this girl? This girl was a beautiful, unbelievable, educated, just the, her smile. Oh my gosh. There wasn't a video of Mia that I have seen on her TikTok, her Instagram, that she's not smiling. She was always smiling. So I pray to God she's up in heaven, smiling down upon her family and friends because they miss and love her so much. Since the day that they put baby girl to rest, her father has gone to her gravesite every single day every day to let her to let her know he's still here he's here for her because he feels he failed her the family did not fail mia the apartment complex and the sheriff's office failed mia and then parents let's teach our sons no means no we have a right to say no Fly high, Princess Mia, and I'll see you guys on my next video. Have a great day.